and then you apply that precision cut, I guess. It's kind of like a reverse mullet. Party in the front, business in the back. This is Founder Quest. Hi, welcome to Founder Quest. This is Ben. Today I'm interviewing Garrett Diamond. Star and Josh are taking the day off, and I get to chat with Garrett, who's a longtime friend of mine and fantastic entrepreneur and all around great person in the world. So I'm excited to, to have you here. Garrett, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always fun catching up with you. I think the last time we chatted was uh, Business of Software a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Not frequently enough. <laughs> so that was, yeah, definitely not frequently enough. I, one thing I, I most remember about that Business of Software was that was when the hurricane was coming through. And so I was standing out there in Boston with all the wind and the right, and the yeah, yeah. You know, oh, man. Having grown up in the South, that was kind of ironic that I was there in, in the Northeast and getting a hurricane. Right. <laughs> so how have you been? Three uh, years or so. Just uh, probably about the same as everybody else, man. You know, just kind of <laughs> one day at a time and and keeping it going. And yeah, just kind of dabbling and exploring. And for once, the last two years, just kind of let myself be undirected and just kind of followed what was interesting and pulled on threads and a little unnerving, but also kind of nice and refreshing. I don't know, you know, it kind of bouncing yeah. around like a ping pong ball. <laughs> Well, that's, that sounds pretty cool. Well, let's talk about that in a minute. I want to catch people up. So I'm sure most people know you, but uh, just for those who don't. So Garrett, again, has been a long time entrepreneur. I think, uh, I think I first bumped into you with doing Sifter, your app from a few years ago. You uh, built that from scratch, solo entrepreneur, and then you sold that. Then you're at, you were at Post, Postmark for a while for that, right? Mm -hmm. You went from Sifter well, to Postmark. Well, a bit at large, but primarily on Postmark. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. So you're Wildbit for a while. And then I guess it was a couple of years ago now that you've left Wildbit. Yeah, right? it's been uh, about two and a half years, I guess now. Okay. Yeah. And so I guess also during that time, you kind of, you did the starting and sustaining book slash video series slash thing. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was pretty cool. Yeah. I've been now, dabbling in all that, trying to, to share my battle wounds so that other people can maybe avoid them or lessen them. Yeah, yeah, and that's awesome. I remember, I remember buying that. It's good, good stuff. So we'll also link that in the show notes. Maybe you'll get a, a sale or two. You spoke, you spoken at MicroConf a few times, or at least once that I can remember. I can't even keep track now. MicroConf spoke once, attended a couple times. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so now you're doing some some interesting stuff. So I remember, I remember when you left a wild bit, you were you were really interested in uh, getting started on helping amputees have a community, and uh, so you started adaptable, right? right? So. I'm going to talk about that for a second yeah. and then maybe we can talk about, you know, how that plan kind of changed for you over the past. Yeah. Year. I mean, so I'm, I'm a left baloney amputee. And when I was trying to make that decision, I couldn't find any information on what life is really like as an amputee, let alone specific information about, can I play basketball still? If so, how does that work? Or what other activities can I do? And there's just not a lot of detailed information. and with disability, even just within amputees, the range is incredible. Like above knee and below knee makes a complete difference in how you function and your body mechanics. And so I just couldn't find this information out there. And so that kind of planted the seed that obviously it's not out there and it's woefully underinformed, which at first was kind of scary. It's like, oh, I guess nobody does any of this stuff. And for me, the whole, ironically, the whole point of amputating was so that I could get back to doing things because of my ankle fusion was horrible and it was just hurt and was miserable. And through the whole thing, I was blogging about it. And what would happen is people would email me because they'd go on Google and search for amputation, ankle fusion, that kind of thing. And then they'd ask me, like, I'm, because I was the only person that came up and I would get these emails, you know, it kind of varies and go ebbs and flows, you know, two a month, once a week. You know, so frequently enough, and a young woman that reached out to me, she actually uh, amputated and then just won a couple gold medals in the Paralympics. It just blew my mind. It's like, how do you find the answers to this stuff? And uh, after being an amputee now about five years and trying stuff and just kind of figuring it out, my hope was originally, I was like, well, I'm a software developer. I'll build a platform so people can share that information. You know, and I figured I was really optimistic about that specifically because, well, I built Sifter and Rails has gotten way better. And I learned a ton from Sifter. So it'll be way easier this time around. But what I didn't really account for was now I've got a family. 
and I'm 20 years older. And so it's been more challenging. At the end of the day, I'm just tapped on software because I'm doing that all day and my brain's... But I've been doing videos kind of explaining this stuff to people about how legs work and the logistics of like how they change your body mechanics and how to do things like go to the beach and deal with sand in your foot and that kind of stuff. And I did that more as like an exploratory, whimsical thing because that was the kind of content I hope people would create and put on the platform. So then you could filter and say, here's my disability. Here's the activity I want to do. Give me all the information about that specific. But I did it and then just kind of left it for a year. But it's just kept going. And then more people have been contacting me. And so now what I'm doing is kind of stepping back from the software side of it. And I'm just going to keep recording videos for the next short term and having them produced and that kind of stuff and hopefully increasing the quality and the depth and then doing interviews with other amputees and really kind of getting into more and then eventually circling back to building a platform to help people find the right things that meet their needs and that kind of thing. So, you know, it's been tough. I think the toughest thing is realizing that nonprofit side projects are the hardest thing to make time for because it's never going to offset my income or anything. And so like, now I've kind of been thinking, I guess I need to build a business again. So I've got more, ironically, more free time just because SaaS and recurring revenue, all that's so great that it give, would give me the flexibility to do that and to spend more time helping people and building software and all that. So kind of just juggling things and figuring it out. And that's kind of where a lot of the exploration has come in. I haven't really prescribed where I'm taking things and spending a lot of time dabbling in Ruby and getting kind of deeper into it than I ever have previously and exploring video and trying to help people with that stuff. So just kind of playing around and tinkering and trying to make ends meet at the same time. And I'll figure it out, I guess. <laughs> That's cool. Well, there's, there's a whole lot to unpack in there. So let's, let's talk about some of that. So some of the, some of the themes. Well, uh, first, I guess I should say, I can totally relate to you with the whole, you know, 20 years later and now there's yeah, you know, there's more demands on your time. There's less energy in the body. And there's, you know, less energy in the brain probably is more important. <laughs> I've had that, that same thing. I recently started picking up some side projects, you know, and like, yeah, they're just, you have fewer hours in the day that you really feel like being really into that kind of mode, you know, with that hardcore brain stuff. And, and I've noticed that I, I can tell like when my blood sugar is getting low and now or like I've, I've used up too many brain cells, I got to go back and recharge, you know. So it's interesting that dynamic. It's like I don't quite have the appetite that I used to have to just dive in and, and you know, slog away at the keyboard for, you know, hours for, on end. For me, it's also been awareness. Like I recognize it more now when I when I was younger, I would push through and be like, oh, grind and hustle. And, you know, and now I'm like, OK, I need to stop. This isn't, you know, if I don't stop, I'm going to be a complete mess tomorrow and not want to work and not be able to think. And so I catch it earlier and I just stop and I hate it because I still am like interested in like whatever problem is in my head is still tugging on it. And, you know, it's trying to, and it's really hard to just turn it off and walk away, but I've gotten better at that a little. Yeah. I think one of of the things that I've noticed as, as I've gotten older in this tech world. So I've, I guess I've been doing it 25 years or 30 years or so. Is that so that, that energy for doing all the things is not there like it used to be, but it seems like the deep thinking is more refined, is more honed. So like you said, like you're going to be, you know, you're just not going to have the energy. You're not going to, you're going to be wasted the next day. And I think I, I've, I've seen that too. And I think it's not just from like the, the energy of working. It's from the energy of thinking deeply about what's the right solution here. Right. And it's not so much like just powering through it. Okay, I'm going to build this stuff and oh, I'm going to backtrack and I'm going to redo and backtrack and redo. Now it's like, oh, I'm going to think about this and I'm going to get it right. right? And then you apply that, that, that precision cut, I guess. And, and for me, the struggle is having the wisdom to recognize I should stop, but I can't turn off the excitement or the interest. Right. right? Yep. And so yep. I Same. do still yep. want to work on it. I just know better. And it's hard when those two don't align. That's that's been a struggle. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the seen the same thing. But I, I think my limited experience so far has been like the the eventual outcome is better. Even even when I have that, I, I want to do more, but I don't. Ha- I know I don't have the energy to do more. But having that time to reflect more, when I do sit down next time and have that thirty minutes, that hour, whatever, like that time is much better spent coming up with the right solution rather than right. you know just uh, an hour's worth of work. Just the other day, I was and. and I mean, I think we've all had this happen a million times, but this just happened, I don't know, Friday, I think. Banging my head on the desk for an hour and a half 
on this thing that just makes no sense. There's a Ruby thing. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. What am I missing here? Like, is there some like really quirky Ruby behavior I don't understand? And hour and a half. And finally, I was like, I've got to give up. I've got to stop. This isn't getting anywhere. And it was only like three o'clock, right? So I still was like, I had time in the day. I was like, I've just got to stop. The next morning, I sat down within 13 minutes, like salt, cold, right? Like there's no... That was from the time I sat at my desk to the time I solved the problem. And it was just, you've got to step away and clear your head or it just doesn't go well. Yeah, I've had that same experience so many times. And I think... A lot of times you, you hear people say, yeah, just take a break, go for a walk, whatever. And you're like, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to power through it. But it actually does work. <laughs> right, right. Well, for me, walking doesn't because then I'll just fixate on it too much. And like, I need to let go. Like my brain has to let it go. And so for me, usually it's more getting a, re- getting a night of sleep is what kind of resets it for me, at least from what I've found. But, you know, I don't know, probably every three or four months, it's one of those where like, this is going poorly. And the next morning, less than 15 minutes, it's solved. Um, yeah, yeah I, I have that too. Like a good night's sleep definitely goes a reset. The one, the one problem I've had with that though is that then I will wake up at four a.m. and I have the solution in my head. I'm like, oh, got to go do it. I do that too, and for better or worse, I don't even fight the sleep anymore. I just get up yeah. and go start working, and then if I need a nap later or something, I just so be it. But like that's so much of that, like. We're so indoctrinated that like nine to five is when people work. And that's been a really hard thing to let go of too and not feel that way every day. And to basically... And it's not about like working when you feel like it. But it's not like pushing back when the urge to get something done strikes. Like go do it and then circle back, you know, and get some either for rest or whatever, you know, take a long lunch or whatever it is. And I found that to be helpful too, just to try and not force the work, but do it when it's fresh in my head and just go. Yep. Yeah. I I love having that flexibility as a, as an entrepreneur on business owner and being able to work when it's most effective. So, you know, if it's four to four to 10 and then I take a break and maybe come back and hit a couple hours in the afternoon and then I'm done, you know, for the day, that's, that's cool. Right. Right. So I wanted to hit on one other thing from you were talking about there about with Adaptable and, you know, <laughs> I, I love what you were saying about like, ah, there's, a, there's a software solution here. Let me go build that. Right. And then yeah, over time, you're like, uh, maybe, maybe not. And I, I, I can totally relate to that because I feel the same way. It's like, oh, if there's something missing in the world, there's, there's obviously a SaaS there that can satisfy that need. But, but in reality, like SaaS, you don't have to go all the way to SaaS, right? You can, you can start with, you know, YouTube videos or maybe even just a, a Reddit, right? Maybe, maybe you're hanging out in the community and on offering back and building up that stuff that you want to see in the world. Yeah. So there's definitely still an element of that with what I want to do. And a lot of it is like right now I'm focused on videos and more mechanics you know, here's things to think about if you want to get into mountain biking as an amputee or things to think about with snowboarding or, you know, whatever it is. But there's this whole other facet or many facets, really, like limb care and recovery. And, you know, when you beat your leg up doing something active in a carbon fiber socket all day, and then you get home and it's destroyed, you know, you got to take care of it. And so there's things like that. And then there's the financial aspect that like insurance only helps so much with prosthetics. And they help with basic, like daily kind of day to day prosthetics, but they don't help if you need more advanced prosthetics for certain activities. And so for that, you're either on your own or you need to find financial assistance. And there's a ton of great organizations out there that help with that, but they're all nonprofits and their websites are less than stellar and less than informative. And in a lot of ways, it's difficult to find the one that is right for you that will cover the type of equipment you need based on, you know, does your disability fall into the disabilities that they cover? And so there's all these different requirements and details and it's difficult or you forget, right? Like life happens and some organization has an annual grant cycle and it's in October and then October blows by and you're like, Oh crap, I totally forgot to apply for that grant. And now you got to wait till next year. And so you know, my thinking is that it's not just a tool to like educate people and help people find the information they need, but something to proactively help reduce friction and remove the barriers that stop people with disabilities from being active. And that could be everything from pain to financial stuff to simply needing somebody to talk to who's 
done it. And there's just, there's so many solutions and everybody is, even within a category of disability is unique. Even if they're not unique from the disability perspective, the activity they want to pursue might be more unique. And so it's just really difficult to make it all work and to find answers. And you kind of just got to go try. And, you know, from experience, the first couple of times I try a new activity is miserable because I'm just figuring it out. And that takes a lot of the fun out of it. And a lot of people are like, ah, this isn't for me. And, you know, until you learn kind of about that learning curve and how it exists and how it's a lot steeper than it is without a prosthetic or what have you, it's tough and it's easy to give up because it hurts and it's inconvenient. And, you know, there's just, all there. you're worried about your prosthetic, right? You've got this $10,000 prosthetic that you need to survive day to day. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go paddle boarding. Oh, well, what if it gets wet? Can it get wet? I don't know. And there's just so many questions and so many easy reasons to give up or be intimidated. And, you know, it doesn't need to be that way because, and more, more importantly, like once you're in that situation, it's more important than ever to be active and to stay active and to not let it just lock you down on the couch or something. But it's not easy. You know, it's way harder than before. And I don't think it needs to be or doesn't need to be as hard as it is. So, yeah, I'm hoping to help people get answers and, you know, do their thing, whatever it is that moves them figuratively and literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that sounds like a tagline for the website. So we have in our in our family some some experience with, with with kind of obscure medical issues, like which is kind of similar to you know going into a prosthetic situation, right? Where all of a sudden you're into this community where like you have to you can get to speed really quickly on what what does life look like now, and and how do I do the things that I want to do, and uh, where do I go to find that information? And so often it seems that in our case, in our experience is that the only people who really know much of anything are the the doctors that you're working with or the therapists or the the nurses right and and they can connect you to resources but like if you just happen to have the wrong you know chemistry you know, with with someone or you don't just happen to know the right person you can just feel pretty isolated and uh, so i think yeah having having resources for for that is is so helpful cuz i've told my wife a number of times like you could write a book on on all the things that you've learned you know through this experience and and then my and my my brother's family there was a significant motorcycle accident that that left someone with you know just a, a lot of paralyzation from the waist down basically and and his his you know going through all the things that he went through surgeries and the rehab and stuff to get back to a point where he could walk you know which was which was assisted so much by the great people that he had around him but fortunately, he had them, right? For those that don't, it's it's got to be a much, much harder uh, road to hoe. And and it's just all over the board. Amputation is really interesting because what most I most frequently run into with people is their surgeon doesn't want them to amputate and is constantly trying to talk them out of it. But after you go through it, I saw my surgeon. I mean, my surgeon, I had to switch surgeons, but he saw me twice after my amputation. He's never seen me with a prosthetic. He has no idea what I'm doing now. And so these people are asking their surgeons about amputation. The truth is the surgeons, unless they're actively helping, you know, in other contexts and volunteering, they have no clue what life is like after amputation. They might read some stuff, right? And, you know, there's plenty of Paralympians that are amazing. But then you wonder, are those people edge cases or, you know, can anybody run and do that stuff again? Maybe not at that level. And the, your surgeon just doesn't know. And so people were asking the surgeon because that's supposed to be the expert. And then the surgeon's giving them, I don't want to say bad information, but incomplete information. And so it's tough for people because you can't get those answers. Again, every disability is so different, how it affects people and how your doctor, what their background is in terms of how they understand like being active or, you know, doing more than just day-to-day -day functioning. Yeah. There's so many layers to it all. <laughs> So one thing I wanted to go back to was talking about, you know, the time that you spend on that. Obviously, it's, it's tough when you've got a family, you're the breadwinner, you know, you're trying to build a, a nonprofit thing. And at some point, it sounds like you realize, you know what, I just got to, I got to do some work. I got to bring the money in the door, right? I can't spend all my time focusing on this, this nonprofit platform. So it sounds like you, you, you're doing that in your spare time and that you're, you're paying the bills of freelancing, doing a bunch of, bunch of rail stuff. But as you've been doing that, you've actually built some tools that I want to talk about. So it sounds, it sounds like you've been doing this work and this work has prompted you to build the, the review thing that you've been working on and also the, the heat map thing for Minitest. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So the nice thing, the, one, the only intentional thing I've done the last two and a half years is 
to try and make sure that whatever I'm doing, it all kind of syncs up some. And for the most part, that was always leading back to Ruby and or Rails. And you know, so a lot of my client work is helping with legacy apps that are profitable now, but they built the app quickly and there's some, you know, legacy pain that needs to be fixed, refactoring, that kind of thing. And then there was adaptable where I was starting with a greenfield, fresh, modern Rails app. And one of them was fun and the other one wasn't. And I'll let you guess. And so a lot of what I started thinking more about was like, how does an app that has all this legacy cruft get from there to a point where it's not miserable to work on. And you know, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of paths, there's a lot of great books on refactoring and and a lot of that kind of stuff. What I started getting more interested in was how we've got all these great linters and static analysis tools for security, for syntax, for just cleaning up code, right? And a lot of it'll autocorrect and format stuff for you. And the more I I, I dabbled with the tools previously, but they were always so difficult to use because it, and they're all command line, you know, and they all have different syntax, different names for the same flags that do the same thing. Like some are autocorrect, some are right, some are, you know, and so like you got to then remember the quirks. They're using the wrong flags with the wrong tools and it just gets tedious, right? Or like, you know, you want to use a dozen tools, but if you run them all at once, like it's going to take, 20 minutes to run through your whole project when really all you want is like, just look at the files I'm about to commit or, you know, look at the files I just committed and let's do a pass it like with RuboCop or whatever, clean them up. And then I'll commit a separate one that's just pure cleanup, you know, and all these kind of things. But it was so tedious. I loved these tools, but I just wouldn't use them because there was too much friction. And so with Adaptable, and like when I'd start a greenfield project, I was like, you know, I've got to use these tools from the beginning to make sure that it never gets into a bad state. Because once that ship sails, it's too much effort to go back and too much risk to like make those kind of wholesale changes. So it started with just that. I was like, how can I make it easier to use these tools and remove the friction so that they're enjoyable to use? And kind of in the back of my mind was because like guard does a lot of this, right? If you're running guard constantly, but guard also drove me nuts because it would, my fans would spin up and make so much noise and I couldn't concentrate. And so kind of, and I still like guard, but my thinking was, what if the tool could be so convenient that you didn't feel like you needed to use guard to watch files as you change them and that you could do more than just have your automated tests run? Right. So like, what if, and I mean, there's, there's integrations for like RuboCop and stuff, but like, what if you change five files and you could just run a tool that will automatically run all of the relevant things you have against those files that you updated and potentially autocorrect them if you want, or, you know, and this is all theory and it's, it's come together and I'm using it on itself, but it's not ready to like use in other projects yet. That's kind of the next step. But yeah, and that's what I just... I wanted that. I wanted to be able to take it on a project that's raw and has a ton of cruft. And then every time I commit, basically start cleaning up there and just make sure it doesn't regress, right? It only gets better, you know? And basically, it makes it easier to... Or hopefully, will make it easier to just make constant, steady improvement, right? It's not... You run it and then it's like, you know, the tool just throws up its hands. It's like, (laughs) this code base is a mess. Don't even (laughs) use this tool. Uh, (laughs) Instead, I want it to be, you know what? Okay, make some progress. Let's start there. And eventually, you know, over the course of a year, two years, you're going to touch so much of the code. And eventually, it's going to get cleaner and it's going to get better, right? And it's not just formatting, but like you got things like Breakman and things that are for scanning for security issues and all this stuff. And there's so much bundler audit, right? And all these things to make sure that your dependencies in, you know, there's a lot of great tools out there like Code Climate for reporting. But what drives me nuts is when I commit and then it gets to CI and then the CI finds the mistake because the tool, you don't run it locally. Like, okay, well now I got to fix it. And then I got to wait for CI again. And like, I want all these tools to be so frictionless to use it never even makes it to CI. That like CI is bored because it never has anything to complain about because by the time it gets there, it's already perfect. So yeah, so that's kind of the that's reviewer. And it'll hopefully be more like the end of the year. And then I've also been obsessed with mini tests lately. 
because I used to use RSpec and I just, it never meshed with me. It was too, I don't know. It's the, the way I've always described people is like, it's the only thing in Ruby that I feel like is simultaneously very Ruby and very unRuby. And it's just never worked with my head and all the, I'm very dependency averse from years of, you know, dependency breaks or has a security issue in the chain reaction of things that need to be updated and can't be updated because, and so I'm, I'm very dependency averse. And so that's another reason that I've gone with mini tests because it's just there. There's, you know, fewer dependencies. It's simpler. Mini tests output, even with all the formatting options out there, just always, I felt like I was doing way more work than I should have to, to figure out what failed, what went wrong and how to fix it. And uh, so what I've done is really over-engineered a test reporter for mini test to uh, when a test fails, it kind of catalogs what file was in the stack trace, what line number in that file. And so what it's doing is in the background, it's kind of building up a heat map of everything that triggered a problem. And it's also differentiating between like failures and exceptions. Because if your test fails, okay, that's interesting. It's you want to start with the assertion. What was the assertion that failed? But if there's an exception, then the assertion is kind of irrelevant. You want to go dig into the exception. But what if the exception came out of the test? Then you don't want to go waste your time in source code. Just fix the test. Otherwise, you're not going to. And so it differentiates between failures, a broken test, and an exception. And it presents the output differently to kind of guide you in the right direction based on those. And if you've got anything that's failing or broken, it's not going to harass you about skipped tests or slow tests, right? It suppresses those until everything's fixed. And it's like, hey, by the way, you've got four tests here that you've skipped. You need to go write those. And it actually won't bother you about slow tests until all your skip tests are fixed, right? And so it kind of lets you focus on what's important at the time without reminding you of the fact that you've got a lot going on that is pending and problematic or whatever. You know, and so there's a lot of little things like that. And like when you make what one change that breaks a hundred things across your whole project, you know, you're renaming a class or whatever it is. And then you, it just, you will go from like a perfect test suite to a hundred failing tests. You're like, crap. Okay. Where do I even start? And so the heat map will show you like, look, all of these problems come back to this one file, you know, whatever it is, get to the heart of the matter instead of having to like visually scan through a hundred failures and try to find and recognize a pattern. So it's kind of a, a proactive pattern matching reporter, you know, with a few other tweaks to just help nudge and simplify kind of the output so that you can, my hope be, you know, you see a test failure and you know exactly what you need to do to fix it before you even go back to your text editor because you've got enough context. And then obviously that's not always possible, but more often than not, and definitely more often than with just the generic reporter, that's been the case and has been really helpful and saves me a ton of time fishing for what needs to be fixed and what what's worth fixing first and that kind of thing. So I have to think a lot less. I just have to go. And so both of those combined are going to kind of, I'm hoping, work in a way that, you know, you type RVW and it's just smart. And it says, here's all your problems. You're like, oh my gosh, everything's perfect. But you could stand to improve your documentation here in this file. You're like, oh, okay, I can do that real quick. You know, so it kind of nudges you in the right direction without wearing you out about how horrible your code is. When you run all those tools just raw, that's basically what it feels like. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm horrible. I have no idea. I have no business writing code. And that's not a good feeling. But if it's like, hey, you can fix this. Here's how. Oh, okay. I can do that. You know, and there's a lot of really interesting ideas there. Or like, you know, if you've ever run your test suite and it fails and then you run it again and it passes and you're like, oh crap, what was the seed that it used when it failed? And so what reviewer does too in the background is it's recording a bunch of history. And so it'll remember that last failed seed. And so you can, you know, you'd be able to type RBW rerun and it would rerun just the failure and let you zero in on that and focus on fixing that. So there's a lot of little things like that that just want to make it easier. I mean, there's bisect and some great tools out there, but sometimes they're overkill and slow and they take you out of the zone. And I want to make it easier to stay in the zone and get things done and get back on track. Yeah, that sounds, sounds really cool. Yeah, we, I remember having done some, a, a few major Rails version upgrades with the Honey Badger code base, you know, right. you go from five to six or six to six one or whatever it is. And like all of a sudden 
half your tests. You got thousands of tests and like it's, thousands of them are failing. It's the most you know? defeating feeling. You're just like, yeah, oh, okay, I quit for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you know, you, you dive through all those things like, okay, these all look the same. These all look the same. These all look the same. Then go and try this thing here and that thing there. And oh, I made this one change and now half of those failing tests are now passing. Okay. Now I'm, you know, so yeah, having the heat map, I think sounds like a great idea. And then of course, you know, you, you mentioned if, if it's an exception, you know exactly where to go. I'm like, yeah, it sounds like honey badger, right? You get the context that you need to know what to fix. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Although I must say I I'm, I'm an RSpec fan have been for a long time and I've tried, you know, going back to mini tests cause I'll start a new rails app like this, this new side project I started a few, few months ago. I'm like, ah, it's a new Rails app. Let me, you know, let me yeah. try mini test again because that's the default. And so I'll get in there for a bit. But then like, I th- one of the things I've come to realize is that I, what I love about RSpec is despite having, you know, I, I can feel you about the dependency aversion. Yeah. But at the same time, RSpec is kind of like a batteries included kind of thing. Like you've got the mocking, right? Mm-hmm. You've got the stubbing. You don't have to worry about, well, I do, do I do a mini test mock or do I do mocha? You know, like all that's kind of like Rails itself, right? It's kind of kind of its own duck and it has yep. everything included. So you don't have to think about things. No, right? and, so. and don't get me wrong. I, I don't dislike our spec. It just doesn't work with my head. And yeah. like, yeah. I just get overwhelmed with how much it has. And so for me with many tests, like you're like, Oh, which mock thing to use? Neither. Like if I feel like I need to mock something, I need to refactor it. So it's more easy to test efficiently and directly because like mocks i mean that has the all has its own issues right like yeah. and so for me and, and it's, it was very much a mental thing like i just fully embraced and accepted many test limitations and now i use that as kind of a nudge to be like all right if this is really difficult to do then it's not that i need better testing tools it's that i need my code to be organized in a way that lets me test this appropriately and efficiently without needing to set up 20 unrelated models so that it won't fall over. And so that's kind of been more of a, a philosophical thing because previously when I tried mini tests, that, that's exactly what happened. It drive me nuts. I'm like, how the hell do I do any of this? Because my brain, what little I did understand of our spec, I had learned to think that way about things. And so then I found myself doing all this like, how do you mock in mini tests? And how do you, and it's like, you don't. You know, use Mocha <laughs> or, you know, what have you. And so kind of accepting that and just saying, you know what, when it, when mini test pushes back, I'm going to listen and I'll just refactor. And at first it was a little painful, but now it actually has been really, really nice. But I will say too, a lot of that goes hand in hand with like, I've been doing a lot of like deeper, deeper reading on Ruby and thus kind of understanding patterns, you know, being able to see more patterns to refactor like, oh, this is why this is hard to test. Really, I just need to refactor using this pattern and take this approach instead or whatever. And so that's helped because otherwise, I feel like I know I need to change this, but I don't even know where to start. So, you know, th- that's definitely been a philosophical thing I had to accept. Yeah, that makes sense. So you mentioned code climate and I know, you know, in the early days when code climate started, like it was basically a wrapper on top of Flay and Flog, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and eventually Breakman and stuff, right? They assembled all these open source tools and put a nice UI on top of it, which is fine, you know, but you could just run all the tools yourself, right? But review sounds pretty cool because you're basically giving that code climate kind of experience, but it's on your own, right? Yeah. It's in your own CLI. And you could, I mean, conceivably, you could even use it like with left hook or something to do a, a git pre-commit kind of thing, mm-hmm. which, you know, might have its own problems, but still it's an option, it's, right? It's so definitely if you wanna... on the radar. There's a lot of git integration that I'm, I'm planning on. So you can do like RBW staged and it'll just mm-hmm. look at the staged files or RBW untracked. It'll just look to your, the files that you haven't staged, that kind of thing. Yeah. Super handy. Do you see a path where review become there's some sort of commercial component to review, or do you think it's there's? I've got a bunch of ideas that I think could. I mean, the core one is just going to be an open source gem. If I do follow any model, you know, it's probably going to be something more like Sidekick, where there's the core thing that is helpful and useful and free for eternity, and then there would be more advanced either team functionality or kind of sharing of configuration files. There's a whole ton of tools that I've thought about building to things like if you have an existing app, it can kind of auto detect and suggest, Hey, you might want to use these 
gems, these tools. Obviously, it's built in Ruby, but the idea isn't that it has to be Ruby centric. It's really, at the end of the day, it's just a wrapper for command line tools that give you some kind of either pass fail or score output. And so like if you've got 10 tools set up, like on Reviewer, I've just gone overboard. Like I'll use everything because I want to kind of test it, you know, and dog food it. And so like if one fails, it doesn't bother running the rest of them. And so the idea is if you configure it in the order of priority, like start with bundler audit, right? Because if you've got a gem that's out of whack, then you need to fix that because that'll ripple. And so it'll just stop there. So you don't have to wait 10 minutes for a, a whole suite to run on a huge project. It just fails immediately and says, fix this. And then you fix that and then it runs. And then two, and this is all theoretical at this point because I haven't played with it, but I've got some, I'm really excited about the idea potentially, and I hate to make it Ruby 3 only, but playing with Ractors and some, some threading and stuff so that you can have Rubocop running in parallel with, you know, especially with multi-core processors picking up and all this kind of stuff. I feel like there's a lot of potential like, what if you could run 10 tools in parallel and have the whole thing run in seconds instead of minutes? And, you know, that could be really cool. There's other challenges there, but, you know, that reporting, obviously, I'm like code climate. I feel like that's one of code climates really big. But for me, the reporting is going to be more an afterthought. I want it to be a local thing that you can use friction free. And then if people like it, which I hope they will, I mean, I'm really excited about it. I love using it to build itself. It's been wildly helpful, you know, then, yeah, I'd start thinking about, you know, what other options are there for how it could be better and do even more cool stuff for teams or people who are just really serious about using it or, you know, what have you. I love the sidekick model, you know, give that great open source core that has the great functionality and then build on top of that, you know, things that are useful to people who are you know going to use it more intensely. And I think, I think it, Sidekick definitely has that sweet spot of it's it's an operations right, kind of right. thing where you're going to be you're going to be running this forever in your production environment. So you want to pay that licensing fee, you know, every month, every year, whatever. And then there's also like the the HashiCorp model, right, where they have very very good open source tools. You know, you can use Packer or Terraform or whatever. You know, never paying them a dime. But they also have great team collaboration tools if you want to move to their mm-hmm. hosted platform. You know, and coordinate your Terraform running or you know your console, you know, or your vault or whatever, right? They have a, a pro or enterprise offering for every one of those that can do additional stuff, enhancing it. You know, So yeah, some great options there. Yeah. And, you know, I will say too, a lot of my um, thinking since selling Sifter has been, I don't really want to run a SaaS app again. And I'm sure you can guess all the reasons. At the end of the day, the simplest thing, and I mean, I knew it when I was running Sifter, but I didn't, fully appreciate it was the degree to which I let it chain me to notifications and alerts of problems and a never ending fear that as soon as I went camping or hiking out of cell service was the day it was going to fall over in a bad way. And like, it wasn't this like huge thing, but it was just in this like ever present anxiety and after I didn't have that anymore was just such a like epiphany that I was like, I don't really want to go back there. And if I build a SaaS app, it needs to be something that can be designed in such a way that it's resilient. And I know that, you know, if it goes into a certain state and it's like that for six hours or something, nobody's going to be too upset. And I couldn't think of anything. And so, yeah, so then I just started building these gems and I was like, I'm just going to build the gems and see where that takes me. I mean, really, I feel like I'm just kind of pulling on a thread right now based on my personal curiosity and then just trying to also keep in mind, like, let's make sure this would also be useful for other people at some point, wherever that is. Yeah, yeah. I'm, (laughs) of course, totally with you on the whole, like, it's tough to run this as because, yeah, it is. And yeah, I was thinking about just the other day, I was, this, this side project I'm working on, it's like, well, it's, it's actually right now just for fun. But of course, it's like, well, how, how would I, how do I make money on this if I wanted to? And I could run a SaaS, and this is a SaaS thing. It's, it inter- integrates with GitHub, and so it's it's definitely a web-based kind of stuff you do. But you know, if it went down for a few hours, people wouldn't you know be screaming like if right. they were screaming about Honey Badger going down for a few hours, right? right? So like, it's like that's okay. And then on the other hand, it's like, well, it's it is very tightly integrated into GitHub, so I could do a self-hosted here's a Docker image kind of thing. You go run this, and it talks to your GitHub Enterprise installation behind your firewall, right? 
So I think, yeah, it's really good for entrepreneurs to today who are solo to be thinking about that kind because of, there are a lot of options. There's the, you know, there's a sidekick model where you just give one some, someone some code, right? They license it, they run it, and it's, it's all them, right? Or maybe you build a SaaS app that is also a Docker image that they can deploy themselves. Maybe the code's available, you know, as maybe it's an open source thing even, like it's like Mattermost, right? You can, you, they have a hosted option, they have an open source option, they have a self-hosted option. Yeah, it's, it's just, I think, really good to be thinking about these things yeah. as you're you know, deciding what you're doing day to day, because it does, does affect quality of life. Like my, my first thought was when I was, when I was thinking about the SAS, I was like this side project as a SAS, I was like, well, then I got to have the laptop with me all the time because, <laughs> you know, right, or like how, how can I avoid? I think I would much <laughs> rather have an iMac, but like, yeah. as long as I'm involved in anything that can go offline, I don't think I can survive with just an iMac. I've got to have a laptop. And like, I don't like that feeling. I don't know. Right. I mean, I don't yeah. think anybody, but, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, and I, sometimes I think about it at kind of a meta level, like, oh, that's a problem to solve. Like, how do you help solo entrepreneurs run SaaS operations without having to be, you know, always on like, yeah, that's an unsolved problem. If someone solves that, that will be, I think worth some, I mean, Heroku has done a pretty good job yeah. of solving that problem, but it's not a hundred percent solved yet. So yeah. Well, there's, yeah, hopefully it's, for me, like I built a job board for our, community here in the valley just because tourism based economies like the turnover and stuff is high and and so like for me i was thinking with that and i haven't done this because it's just not critical enough but the only thing i thought it would be like with a job board if you could have it fall into read-only mode where it's basically heavily cached on the front end and that's something that could work but most apps where you're interacting with them, you know, because posting jobs, it's not like you constantly post jobs, you post a job. And if you can't post a job right now, you can come back in six hours and that's fine. It's not the end of the day, you know, end of the world. But that's the only thing I've been able to come up with that has felt like it wouldn't be a huge issue as long as you designed and built it right uh, so that it could do that. But everything else, I'm like, nope, that won't work. That won't work. Like, I think that's why I haven't started another business yet. Is because I've become really picky. Like after selling Sifter, I'm like, what do I really want to do and not do again? And so much of the SaaS stuff, while it's great, it was just like, it took a toll. Like it made me not want to do so many things that now I love doing, like camping and hiking and like getting out of cell service. And so I don't want to give that up anymore. So I guess the, the moral of the story is do all that kind of stuff when you're in your 20s <laughs> and you have plenty of energy right. and you don't hate it yet, right? And then uh, try to come up with something different by the time you're in your 40s. <laughs> Use the experience to uh, more wisely choose your battles. Yeah. yeah. Right. Cool. Well, this has been total fun. So uh, thank yeah, you yeah, so much for, glad, for joining me. Glad to catch up. Is there anything that uh, we should have talked about that we didn't? Oh, probably a ton of stuff. No, I mean, I wish this stuff was all in a, a better state. Mini test heat is, is good to use now. I need to add a little bit more exception handling because now every now and then something goes wrong with mini test heat and like you can't see your own test failures because it fell over. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of my next step is to add some resiliency to that so that if it breaks, it says, hey, mini test heat fell over on this, but your thing's fine and have some like simple output so you at least can see something. Because every now and then I have to go disable it and switch back to the regular reporter so I can actually see the the failure, but you know, it's ready to use. I'm using it every day on all my projects now. And it's been pretty, pretty fine. Today was the first time in like a week that I've seen any kind of issue that didn't work. So that's people can use it. It definitely needs some tidying up and improvements, but that's forthcoming. And reviewer will hopefully be the end of the year. We'll kind of see how, how things shake out with the holidays and all that, how much work I'm able to get. To. I'm optimistic because I, I want it. I want to use it on another project. Like every time I go work on reviewer, I'm like, oh, I really wish I had this for my other projects where I've just got dumb scripts that just run the same commands in order. And, you know, it, it's close, but it's not the same. And I don't know, I'm really excited about how much it's, I know it's going to help my like day to day workflow. And I'm hopeful anybody else that's using Ruby will find those same benefits and hopefully other languages too. I don't know. I haven't really tried. I mean, in theory, JavaScript and a lot of that stuff will work, like with a Rails app and like ERB learning and and whatnot. So hopefully, but I haven't tried anything wholly outside of a Ruby project to see if it could be useful there, but it should be. It's just a wrapper around command line strings. So hopefully. Cool. And then next up, a VS Code plugin, right? Where it's all just running all the time, right? right? Beside your code. Right. Yeah. 
Maybe, maybe that's your thing you sell. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I haven't thought about that too much because most of them you can plug in on their own, but then that gets overwhelming. And you're trying to edit your file and it's like just yelling at yep. you about everything. Yep, right. <laughs> like, just let me think first and then yell at me after the fact, after I've like figured it out. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm excited about it. It's, it's, it's kind of the most fun I've had programming in a long time. So we'll see. Well, I love it. Well, scratching your own itch is always fun. And if you can make some money while you're at it, hey, even, even fun. Right, right. Well, and so like, that's the thing, like, just kind of circle back and wrap it up. Like, part of it is in order for me to really pursue adaptable, I've got to have some kind of automatic income. And like with Sifter, that would have been perfect. You know, recurring revenue is great. And so a lot of it too is like, ah, if I'm really going to unlock adaptable's potential, I need to not be, you know, have an income tied to hourly rates. It's got to be divorced from how much time I'm actually sitting at my computer. And so that's kind of been a driver too. But again, more just wandering and figuring it out and hoping it all comes together somehow. That's, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we will definitely link up the heat map and review and definitely get some people to check it out if you're Rubyist and we'll, we'll link up your, your Twitter. So people can follow you and keep track of what you're doing. Thanks again yeah. for hanging out yeah, with me. Yeah, thanks. Great to catch up. And thanks everybody for listening. Again, you've been listening to Founder Quest from the founders of Honey Badger. We're excited to continue bringing you exciting uh, episodes on the podcast and a fantastic product with Honey Badger, of course. So check us out, honeybadger.io. And uh, you know, as Star always says, review us if you like and don't review us if you don't like. But have a great one. Founder Quest is a weekly podcast by the founders of Honey Badger. Zero instrumentation, 360 degree coverage of errors, outages, and service degradations for your web apps. If you have a web app, you need it. Available at honeybadger.io. Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word, where you can access our huge back catalog of episodes. Founder Quest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week.